This is part two of the uh, presentation on the Vietnam War. Let's begin with the election of 1968. If you'll remember from part one of this presentation, the Tet Offensive, which happened early in 1968, tremendously weakened the political position of Lyndon Johnson. He announced in the spring that he would not run for re-election. Uh, he had challengers. He had uh, Eugene McCarthy. He had Robert Kennedy or Bobby Kennedy, and he and he had uh, you know the the finally the uh, contender for the Democratic nomination nomination was his vice president Hubert Humphrey. Uh, Kennedy was shot and killed in June. Uh, Humphrey ended up winning the nomination, but he was burdened by his association with Johnson. Uh, he had been a supporter of the war, which he uh, almost had to be as Johnson's vice president. It was only late in the campaign that he began to separate himself from Johnson and call for uh, withdrawal from Vietnam. Uh, but by then, uh, it was too late. He was gaining ground, but uh, Richard Nixon, the Republican opponent, uh, won a narrow victory. Nixon claimed uh, that he had a secret plan to end the war. Uh, it was bogus. It, he didn't have one. It didn't exist. Uh, but he did win a narrow victory uh, in the uh, election of 1968. One question that we had to confront in uh, understanding the Vietnam War uh, is how did we define victory? Now that sounds like an unusual question because in most wars, uh, it's not hard to define victory. In World War II, what we had to do was uh, absolutely defeat uh, Germany and Japan. Uh, they weren't going to quit, and uh, we had to conquer them. We had to completely uh, you know, uh, re take away their ability to fight back. Uh, but in Vietnam, it wasn't that simple. It was conquering Vietnam, North Vietnam, uh, a reasonable goal? Well, no, it was never our goal. Uh, we were very concerned about the possibility of nuclear war with the Soviets or about the possibility of Chinese entry into the war. And remember what had happened uh, in uh, the decade, uh, about a decade and a half before, and that was in the uh, Korean War. Uh, when we invaded North Korea, uh, the uh, Chinese entered into the war, and that was a problem. Uh, now, what about protecting democracy in South Vietnam? Um, sounds like a worthy goal, except for one thing. Uh, South Vietnam was not a democracy. It was brutal. It was corrupt. It was hated by most of the South Vietnamese people. So what are we protecting? How about helping the South Vietnamese people? A humanitarian goal. But what do we do to them? We, we, we cause the death, directly or indirectly, of huge numbers of them, and we turn three million South Vietnamese people into refugees, partly through the, the process of pacification and strategic hamlets that we talked about in part one of this presentation. So how, again, were we helping them? Okay, what about containing communism? That was the general U.S. policy throughout the Cold War. Containment, don't let it spread. Uh, well, the problem was it was much, much harder to do that. And the, the answer lies in, uh, the reason for that lies in geography. Um, in Korea, there was a demilitarized zone, a DMZ, that stretched across the peninsula. Uh, but there was water on both sides, and the U.S. Navy uh, control those waters. So uh, to invade South Korea, the North and the Chinese uh, had to fight a conventional war. They had to overrun uh, the U.S. military uh, over the DMZ. Well, uh, the U.S. military is very good at fighting con conventional wars. Uh, so we were able to hold that until there was a truce. But in Vietnam, uh, the there's water uh, to the east of Vietnam, but there's jungle to the west. And uh, this, this is in the countries of Laos and Cambodia. And the North Vietnamese were pouring 
huge numbers of uh, troops, of materials, weapons, uh, supplies uh, through the jungle uh, along what was called the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, there were tunnels there, there were uh, you know, uh, footbridges, the, there were, it was all covered by uh, dense uh, jungle growth and it was extremely difficult uh, to stop that flow uh, southward and then there were a hundred different places where uh, they could infiltrate people across the border uh, and back into South Vietnam. So this was a guerrilla war and we were not as well prepared to fight that kind of war. And there's another point here too. Uh, was communism one thing? Monolithic is, is a word that literally means one stone. It means one thing, one unified uh, concept. Now was uh, Soviet communism the same as Chinese communism? And was Chinese communism the same as Vietnamese communism? Well, the, the history tells us that uh, the uh, Vietnamese had a, a, a long, long hatred of the Chinese. Sometimes they uh, accepted help from them, uh, but, but this, they were not the same thing. Uh, so if we just paint communism with a broad brush and say, a communist is a communist is a communist no matter where, uh, that's misleading. So we never did come up with a convincing way to define victory in the Vietnam War. Now Nixon, when he took office, uh, relied heavily on bombing. He dropped more bomb tonnage in Vietnam than had been dropped in all of World War II by all sides. Um, a lot of the bombing was secret, such as the bombing of Cambodia, what was known as the Christmas bombing. Uh, he relied on air power to blunt public opinion because people uh, were getting very, very tired of the war. Americans were being drafted. Americans were dying in appalling numbers. And Nixon uh, adopted a strategy known as Vietnamization. Vietnamization, that means uh, turning the biggest burden of the war uh, to South Vietnamese troops rather than to American troops. And to make that work, he depended on air power and bombing. Um, now, ultimately that, was, that failed, but that was his strategy. Uh, and the bombing uh, and the, the, the continuous uh, long duration of the war led to increasing protests. Uh, one of them was at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. Um, the purpose of uh, the bombing had been to force peace negotiations, uh, but that uh, was a very slow process that wasn't really going anywhere, uh, and the protest intensified. Um, Nixon re reorganized the draft. Uh, people were drafted to uh, serve in the army in, in Vietnam. Um, under Lyndon Johnson, college students had been able to get draft deferments as long as they were in college. Um, it was called a student deferment. And uh, Nixon decided to change that because um, it was unfair. Uh, it gave uh, uh, privileged, uh, you know, status to uh, people who had the, uh, the, the money and the background to go to college. And he had a point there. Uh, it was also true that he hated college students, who usually, by the way, hated him. Uh, so he began a draft lottery so that everybody, whether they're in college or not, uh, would uh, be in the same boat. So uh, here's the way it worked. It was, the first one was at the end of 1969 the first year of Nixon's presidency. There was a huge barrel filled with balls with, and there was one ball for each uh, date of the year for, you know, September 12th or uh, July 13th, or something like that. And uh, people came uh, who, who were, whose job it was to draw these balls out of the barrel. It was uh, rotated, it was turned around, so it was random. Uh, and uh, 
the first date that was drawn out was uh, the first group of people who would be called, uh, those who were born on that day. Uh, this applied to all men uh, ages 18 to 26, and they got a lottery number. Uh, most people from that era remember what their lottery number was. Um, now, whoever got the low numbers, as I said, would be called up first. But eventually, anybody with a number going all the way up to 195 was called to the draft. They had to report for a draft physical, and uh, so the process was initiated of uh, putting them into the uh, armed forces. Uh, this did not stop the protests at all. Um, the most dramatic of them was an anti-war protest at Kent State University. And this is a famous photograph of a young woman asking why uh, this killing had to take place. The Ohio National Guard, which was dominated by rural Ohioans without a lot of, of military experience at all, uh, were called off by the governor and they opened fire on unarmed students. They panicked. Um, four students were killed two men, two women, all of them 19 or 20 years old. Uh, nine more were wounded. And this provoked an overwhelming response. Over four million college students at hundreds of colleges and high schools went on strike after that. They said, enough, this war has to stop. And eventually none of the shooters were convicted. They were tried. Uh, but they were not convicted. Uh, they claimed that they were firing in self-defense, uh, which uh, most people didn't believe. Now, in 1973, finally, there was a peace settlement reached uh, at in Paris. It was called the, the uh, or the uh, the peace accords. Uh, most American troops had been taken out by then uh, as a result of Nixon's policy of Viet Vietnamization, turning things over to the South Vietnamese military. Um, the draft was over in 1973. Nobody else was being drafted. Uh, the North agreed to accept the president of South Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. President Chu. Um, but there were still 150,000 North Vietnamese troops still in the South. Um, so the situation was not stable. Um, the, uh, a council was set up to find a permanent solution, but negotiations in that council broke down uh, and uh, the war resumed, uh, this time without uh, significant U.S. involvement. The uh, South Vietnamese military could not hold out, and uh, Congress had passed the War Powers Act, uh, which said you know, a president cannot send troops into battle without, for more than 90 days without the approval of Congress. There was a major offensive by the North Vietnamese Army, a little U.S. support, President Ford who had succeeded Richard Nixon after Nixon resigned in the Watergate scandal. That's a topic for another presentation. Uh, President Ford asked for aid to try to shore up the South Vietnamese government, but Congress had had enough and they said no. Uh, the result of all of this was a North Vietnamese victory in April of 1975. And in the photo here, you see people climbing up to the top of the U.S. Embassy, these are people who had worked closely with the United States and who would have been in danger uh, had they stayed. Uh, they were getting onto a helicopter and there was a, a parade of helicopters uh, that flew them out to U.S. carriers in the, at sea. Uh, and uh, many of these uh, refugees ended up coming to the United States. Uh, this was a humili humiliating end to the war for Americans. Uh, this was a war that the United States lost. Uh, Saigon, the capital, uh, is now called Ho Chi Minh City. 
Vietnam is unified as one country, and uh, you know you might say it's a communist country. In a sense, it is, but it has followed a pattern a lot like China. China is still officially a communist country, but their economy is much more capitalist than uh, anybody had ever dreamed it would become. Uh, now, if we talk about Vietnam, uh, a similar thing happened. Uh, one could argue, in a sense, that the Vietnam War was won, was won by an American colonel. Uh, his name was Colonel Sanders of Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, because this is a Kentucky Fried Chicken, a symbol of American capitalism in the Vietnamese capital of Hanoi. And this is Hanoi today. Uh, it's a modern city. Uh, it reminds us of the growth of some uh, Chinese cities. So uh, who won the Vietnam War? You decide.